Um, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm so excited to welcome you to the conference and um, so excited to get to know you. I will be running around with my camera this whole weekend, so if you see me snapping your picture, um, introduce yourself. I'd love to meet you. So, um, as Jasmine said, I worked in disaster relief prior to coming to med school, and today I'm going to focus in on uh, my work in Haiti as part of the team there after the earthquake in 2010 and um, in Nepal. So this is like an aerial view um, in City Soleil area where we worked, and I worked there for about 10 years, but I'll tell you more about that later. So first we're going to start off with a patient case and uh, evacuation that didn't really go as planned, and then I'll tell you a little, a few stories and hopefully share a few tips and things that I learned that might be applicable to working on the wards, uh, if you want to get into working in disaster relief, or just wilderness medicine, it's all hopefully some tips that might be helpful. Okay, so... So yeah, I was, in, I was on the clinical team in Blanchard, which is right outside of Port-au-Prince um, during the 2010 earthquake. And then in Nepal, I was part of a remote area medical team. So we were tasked with getting into the areas that were blocked by debris or other issues in the rural areas near the epicenter in the city of Okay, so this is some footage from Nepal. This is in the Sindhupal Chum district, and this was actually a school that ended up being uh, ended up collapsing. So luckily, the school was not in session during this day, but there were a few people who were trapped inside. And so I'm going to tell you a bit about one of those patients. So she was a 32-year-old woman pulled out of the rubble by her family members, so even before um, response teams, and we also worked, you saw, from, uh, with the Nepalese army, and so she was pulled out by her family, and they told us that her right leg was also pinned under the rubble for an extended period. Um, so, like everything in EMS, wilderness medicine, we'll start with the ABCs. So, her airway, she was talking to us, for breathing, she had equal breath sounds. She was a bit short of breath, but she was also very understandably anxious in that situation. Uh, she had a pulse, and she was alert and oriented times four. She remembered the event and could tell us a little bit about it. And her vitals are listed here as well. We didn't see any uncontrolled bleeding, and her right her right leg had obvious deformity where that crush uh, happened, but she had her fetal pulse. All right, so first things, the transport decision. Do you want to stay in play or evacuate this patient? So we have the option to initiate rapid evacuation because since we were so lucky to work with the Army in that situation, or we could treat on site. So just by show of hands, who wants to stay in play? One? A couple? Okay, and who wants to initiate evacuation? Crap, okay. <laughs> All right, so evac. So, we decided on a rapid evacuation because of that crush injury. We were concerned that it might develop into crush syndrome and shock and maybe affect, have, lead to kidney failure in that situation. So we wanted to transport her to definitive care as quickly as possible. So I don't want to block you um, All right, so we initiated a helicopter evacuation working with the Nepalese army. So we cleared an area of debris we marked it with chalk, we had smoke signals, and you'll see, I have some footage of that here. And this is what happened. All right, so do you see any issues with our landing area? You can shout out if you see anything. Debris, yeah. So the angle was a little bad. It looked way worse, but yeah, there were, was some debris and obstacles. Anyone else? It looks like that the uh, helicopter's going to land, and that guy's going to be uphill from where the rotors are going to be. Great, yeah, uphill landing, so maybe hazardous for the people on the ground. It's not big enough. It's not big enough. Anyone else? Okay, all solid, solid. Okay, so. Um, this is what ended up going on. You can see a better view of our landing area. They left. 
So, okay. <laughs> so now we have this patient, and we're worried about her. At this point, she was strapped onto a backboard. We had C-spine stabilization. We had splinted that leg. We were ready, and she was packaged, ready to go. And then they just left. <laughs> okay, so what now? We have some options for you here. Would you radio for another helicopter? And note that maybe you'll have the same sort of issues that we experienced before and they won't want to land. Also, it takes a lot of time. We had a lot of uh, high traffic for our pilots in that area because it was really rural and a lot of people needed to get out. Um, B, would you try to make a new landing area? Uh, with this one, we were in a really mountainous area. There wasn't a lot of uh, great flat regions to set down a, a chopper in an appropriate way. Um, but we could have tried to find a different one. Uh, C, truck transport. So we could have loaded her on. We didn't really have ambulances or things like that in this scenario. Uh, so we could have tried to drive her out. But okay. note that we were the remote area medical team. We had a really hard time getting into this village in the first place. Um, there was boulders blocking the road. So that might be a really long time. And we were also really concerned because we didn't want to lose a medical team member who would have had to go with the patient. Or D, uh, load her onto a motorcycle. <laughs> I hope no one takes that. Okay, so raise your hand. A. No one. B. Okay, find a new landing area. C. Truck. Okay, a couple people. D. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So obviously we don't want to put a spinal patient on the back of the motorcycle. All right. So we ended up, whoop, I'll tell you before I show you, we ended up actually being able to get in touch with that pilot and have him circle back to try to attempt another landing. He said he was, had a, like, he, it would have worked, but he didn't have a great feeling about it, so he, just, he said, I'll circle back, I'll check it out again. So here. to make this work, but we ended up being able to radio down to the next town under us that we knew we could get to by truck. We loaded her up on the truck, good suggestion, um, and we, uh, one of the army, med the medics in the Nepalese army volunteered to accompany our patients, so we didn't end up having to lose any of our team members, and they ended up having much more success finding a new landing area in the town next to us. So, moral of the story here, everything can change and it changes quickly. You cannot be married to your plan that applies to wilderness medicine and disaster relief. You have to be flexible, um, we have to be adaptable to the situation and roll with the punches, and quick collaborative problem solving are key. We had to get in touch with so many people to coordinate to get this patient safely out of the situation, and luckily it all came together in the end. But if we had just kept trying to have that guy come and land, um, she probably would still be um, in that area. Okay, the next thing is to prioritize. This was one patient. We had a lot of patients in this one area. We were uh, right here at the epicenter, and the construction of the homes and buildings in that area were just gone when the earthquake hit. Um, so we couldn't spend all day trying to get this one woman out which is a, a huge challenge. Luckily it worked out, but just knowing that you have to focus on triaging and making sure you're taking care of the rest of your patients. Um, communication with various stakeholders is so important. And this is something that I didn't realize was so key before I started working in disaster relief, 
we were working um, with our crew that we had worked with in the past. There was a bunch of other disaster response teams. We were coordinating with the Nepalese Army, with the World Health Organization, with the Nepalese government. And each one of those groups has their own priorities, their own goals in that situation, and limitations and guiding principles. And they're not always going to be the same as yours, and your goals aren't always going to align. And just <coughs> understanding that point saves so much frustration and um, it really helps to kind of think, okay, what are these people's goals and how can we figure out how to make it more attractive so that they'll come up with <laughs> And you have to learn how to navigate this and advocate for your patient. Okay, next we're going to go to Haiti. So I worked in Haiti in 2010 as a first responder. We were there, I think, a week after the earthquake. Um, and I was a pretty new EMT, so just for a little bit of background, I had finished EMT school, I was working uh, on the ambulance and in the ED in California, Southern California, um, not a ton of trauma in my area, and I kind of forced gumped my way into working in disaster relief, and um, it was an awesome opportunity and I'm really happy I took it, but I was pretty green at this point. So this was a patient, uh, I don't know if this is exactly the same patient, but I want to put a picture. Um, who, the first patient came in, she was a 23-year-old woman with head trauma, and she was bleeding pretty profusely, and the team brought her in and started IVs. Everyone was rushing around, and I focused in on that bleeding and wanted to stop it. And honestly, I was pretty new, and I got tunnel vision. I lost the or I got, what is it, when you don't see the forest for the trees in that situation, um, which I think is pretty common um, in these situations when you're new and even sometimes when you're pretty experienced, it can still happen. So I'd like to share some things that have helped me along the way avoid this in the future. Um, and it might help you, especially on Sunday for your patient scenarios. <laughs> it's really easy when you're the one watching the scenario to say, ooh, you could do this, you should do this, and to know what order people should tackle it. But it's a totally different thing when that adrenaline's going and you're working with the patient in front of you. All right, so what helps me a lot is to physically step back as a cue. And a lot of these are physical things, so I find myself cueing myself to step back as a reminder to take a look at the bigger picture in front of me and not to get hung up. That way I can see what needs to be done, prioritize, and then I fall back on that training. We learn an order of operations and a protocol of how we do things and sticking to that every single time. But just taking that one moment to step back really helps. Next thing is similar, but it's just grounding <laughs> techniques, really planting your feet, um, taking a moment to really get back in touch with your body if you start to spin out and think of all these different things that need to be done all at once. Taking a deep breath, all of those things help so much in the moment. And along those lines, this is some of the best advice that I got <laughs> as a new EMT. And I know it's not intuitive because we love action and we like to run in and do it immediately. But don't just do something, stand there really helps. And what I mean by that is not to just stand there the whole time. I literally just mean that right before you do something, check in with yourself. All right, I'm going to do it in this order and I'm going to do that. Here's what my you know, plan of, it, of action is. And then going in. Um, so that way you're not just flustered and starting things and, you know, going after the shiniest object. All right. So now we're back to Haiti. This man who I met was incredible. He was from, I think it was Kentucky. He was an MD. He signed up to be a disaster response worker. He was gung-ho, ready to treat patients. And he got there and there was so many... Um, there are so many dead. I think there ended up being, oh gosh, I should have looked this up before this talk. 200,000, I think, um, died in that earthquake. It was chaos. Um, there was a lot of bodies in rubble. It was, um, this is a pretty typical uh, scene there right after the earthquake happened. So what was really needed in this situation was a morgue, somewhere to place those deceased. So he ended up taking on that role. And I tell you this story because I know when you sign up to work in disaster response, you want to be on the front line treating those patients, but we have to have the humility to do what's needed most in the situation and not what we want to do, and to be able to take direction and go where you're the most useful. So he was a wonderful example of that. 
can learn a lot from Mecca. It's great. All right, so this was Team California. So I had worked in, um, in EMS with these folks and a few others, and we worked really well together. We knew each other's strengths, each other's weaknesses, and um, it was just jiving really awesome. So then when we got to Nepal, we were on the same team again, and we were stoked. We got this handled. We worked awesome. However, <laughs> when you work in the wilderness med, disaster relief, all these things, you're often thrown into new teams with people who you don't usually work with, new personalities, you need to figure out how to jive well together, and you need to have work effectively quickly. So as an example to paint a picture, this is um, some very shaky professional footage I took <laughs> of um, base camp. So we are in Sindhu Palchang, this is in Nepal, and as you can see by the number of colors of tents, um, this was one of the kind of dispatch locations for our region. How many different groups were in that really small uh, area? So you have to work together and figure out how to do it. So I have a few uh, suggestions, some things that make it easy to work effectively with teams that you don't know. So first things is learn names whenever feasible. Not always feasible. <laughs> However, if you're going to work with the same crew for a few days, it really helps. One thing that we did that was really awesome is we got some duct tape and we sharpied our names on it and what our medical licenses were. That way I can look and I know what your level of training is and I can do the next thing, closed loop communication. <laughs> so. I'm really passionate about closed-loop communication. I think it's super important and, again, might be a great thing to practice in your patient scenarios on Sunday. <laughs> um, okay, so closed-loop communication is not like, hey, somebody get a backboard. It's, Michael, can you go grab the backboard? And then he would say back to me. Yes, I will go grab the backboard. Great. <laughs> okay, so this is a wonderful way. You want to make sure that you have a shared mental model in these situations. Everybody is on the same page. You know what's going to happen next. And you have confirmation that what you said really landed and that it's actually going to happen. You can use this with administering medications, simple tasks. You get it. Okay. Next thing is that every team member has a voice. As I mentioned, I was really green in Haiti. I was new. I, um, but in my team, we had such wonderful dynamics that even me, in my lowly position, no, I'm just kidding. EMTs are wonderful. I'm good. <coughs> Eat my words. Okay, so, no, but really, I um, felt empowered, even though I didn't have as much experience as the other members of my team, that I had a voice in that situation. If I had a concern or a question or I didn't know what was going on, I felt like I could really speak up. And as future physicians and team leaders in these situations, it's really important to foster that kind of a dynamic where the people who you're working with can step up and say something. It's good for patient safety. It's good for team morale. So some things you can say, any concerns with my plan? Hey, did this? is there something that I'm missing here? Is there something I'm not seeing? Any ideas? Just simple prompts that make sure that everybody there feels included and empowered. The next thing is to debrief. I'm going to go on this side, so I'm not... Welcome to the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is to debrief. Even in situations where you're rapidly seeing so many patients, taking that extra beat just to say, hey, what went well, what could go better, after a patient that was particularly challenging at the end of the day, or even just briefly in between each, in each patient, if something went right, you can acknowledge it and adjust and move on in a better way. This is just us debriefing. Okay. I wanted to put media here. Okay, so another thing that really helps is, um, I'll just read you this. There are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. Always be in the first group, there's less competition there. So anytime there's something that needs to be done, you anticipate people's needs, you try to be the person that's always going to be doing the work regardless of whether you're going to get acknowledged because this is a stressful, chaotic environment and you're not always going to get that pat on the back and just knowing that and being not even okay with it, being stoked on that, that you're in the first group is um, important. The next thing is to rely on each other. Even if you're in new teams in these situations, you bond 
quickly. There's random people who I met. We only worked on a couple patients together, and then they Facebook me like immediately, and we're still buddies because that is a unique situation to be in. Um, one thing that happened, we bonded over the aftershocks, especially after Nepal. It was like every couple minutes there was aftershocks, so we had to kind of <laughs> every time. Um, and you just make friends and bond quickly. So relying on each other is important. And to do that, assume positive intent. This is one of those things that it's kind of the golden rule of team dynamics, but it helps morale, is to just always assume that everybody on your team is doing the best they can in that particular situation. It just helps everybody feel good and run smoother. Okay, weird question. Has anybody tried Haitian Mamba? Clue. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. So, I'll tell you all about Haitian Mamba. Haitian Mamba is peanut butter with chili oil and cayenne pepper and other peppers. It's very spicy peanut butter, okay? <laughs> I don't actually recommend Mamba at all. <laughs> but the reason, <laughs> and the reason I'm telling you about this is because in the earthquake in 2010, I lived off Haitian mamba and very questionable moldy bread for three days because of this. Don't become part of the disaster, okay? We had a team who we were traveling with who thought they were going to stay a week. They ended up staying for two. They brought food for one week. We bought food for two. Um, so we shared. But then we ran out. So we ate Haitian mamba. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about. Don't become part of the disaster. We all are super gung-ho um, if you are wanting to work in disaster relief. Um, sometimes people are tempted to just go. Uh, I have skills, oops, I have experience, you know, I'll be helpful, and people tend to just show up. So in Nepal, for example, there were some rogue groups with the best of intentions who came with some medical gear. They came um, from all across the country ready to help, and they were really passionate. However, we were there um, as part of an established group. We had a, con uh, not a contract, an assignment from the World Health Organization and the government of Nepal, whereas these groups who showed up did not. So what ended up happening is that there were areas where these groups would go, and nobody really knew about it, but there was kind of rumors that, hey, they showed up in this area ready to help. So then the assignments didn't get assigned to that area. So some areas were missed completely. Other times you would show up and there would just be people all over the place. In fact, one group came and they weren't uh, using proper standard precautions and there ended up being a village who had some sort of wound care done who the whole village was just infected wounds by the time we arrived. Okay, so this is just one of those things where I know some people in this room might want to work in disaster relief in the future, and it's so awesome, I highly recommend it, but just go with some groups who are supposed to be there. <laughs> okay, so, in a disaster though, you are working against so many factors while you're trying to get to and treat your patients and get your patients out if need be. My <laughs> this went on for a while. <laughs> okay, so that was in Nepal. Um, after the earthquake, there was some rains, and uh, it made it a very interesting journey uh, for our, us who were the remote area team. We ended up, once we got past all the mud and the muck, we encountered just straight up landslide and boulders on the dirt roads that we were trying to cross. So luckily, we got some Royal Enfields, <laughs> and we got to load up our gear and bike in for part of it, and then we ended up trekking in. I didn't have a great picture, but proof. <laughs> <laughs> so you're working against weather, that terrain issue, distance, time constraints, shortages of gas, food, and water. You need to make sure you bring enough food and, and know how to get water and all that stuff. And aftershocks or whatever that disaster is. In the Philippines, it was like flooding and water issues. 
Um, you're working against collapsed infrastructure and sanitation. We had some very questionable bathroom situations um, working there. Uh, so one way to not become part of the disaster is just to plan, plan, plan ahead. Having that packing list, knowing for how long you expect to be there, what kind of uh, trauma or other issues you're going to encounter with your patients so you have the appropriate gear that you need, um, etc. You have to be resourceful, but also use your common sense in order to not become part of the disaster. We had a lovely, lovely um, person on our team who um, had never worked in an earthquake before. So she started putting uh, her tent together like right next to a uh, big rocky wall. Um, so just knowing that in order to protect yourself, you have to use that kind of experience and look around. So one thing that keeps you out of the disaster, but it's also just part of working in disaster relief, is to be able to improvise and figure out what to do and be use that ingenuity. Like we made it splints with certain other materials, uh, sometimes camping poles when we ran out because we didn't bring enough the last day. Um, but you don't want to do that with sacrificing patient care. It's a very fine balance to do. So this is one of my favorite quotes. We the willing have been doing so much with so little for so long that we're not qualified to do anything with nothing. <laughs> Sometimes it really feels like that and in wilderness medicine as well. <laughs> the other thing to avoid becoming part of the disaster is a necessary skill set. So I'm not just talking about medically. Hopefully if you're there to be a medical relief worker, you have that dialed down. Um, but I'm talking about things like water purification, how to set up camp, how to figure out how to get in and get out of situations, just knowing and building up that skill set before you go. And finally, or maybe not finally, I think I have one more after this, is uh, have an evacuation plan. Uh, you don't want to be in a disaster zone and then get stuck in a disaster zone. So a lot of times you can get trip insurance like we had where if we needed to get evacuated, we could do that. Other times it's having a flight plan or just having a way out into another neighboring country sometimes, but just having that plan set before you arrive. You want to take care of yourself first so that you don't become a patient. A lot of times, raise your hand if you've worked in EMS. Awesome. We always tell you scene safety, you know, you're the first person you have to take care of, but it's the same this way in physically and mentally. It's a really hard job. Um, in disasters, there's a life-saving stage and a limb-saving stage, and you need to be able to recognize that and take breaks when you can. This is my friend Samuel. This was in Haiti, and he just crashed. <laughs> the reality of the situation was that we were so overloaded in that, um, in that disaster that you don't sleep, you don't eat, you just treat patients work, 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 work until you physically can't and then crash and then quickly come back and do more. It's not ideal, but you need to know your limits and when you need that assistance and when you need those breaks. So after a disaster, life continues on. This is, uh, this is actually a current patient, but she's so cute that I put her in. So um, after we got back, after I got back from Haiti the first time in 2010, I was pretty young. Um, I had never been in a situation like Haiti. I mean, it was absolutely chaotic. And I found myself having a hard time coming back into my normal routine and my normal life. It was, I had just witnessed so much just trauma and so many people who lost their lives and limbs and homes and all of these things. And uh, it was hard to come back and be like, yeah, let's go to surf, yeah, which is my normal life. <laughs> um, but one thing I'd love to leave you with is that we have to have uh, the stubbornness to accept our gladness and the ruthless for us in this world. I don't know who this quote is, but it's a great one. And um, it's really true. You figure out how to compartmentalize and how to adjust when you, arrive, when you get back home in your normal life. It's hard at times. That's one thing about the debriefing and talking it out with your colleagues who were there um, and doing what you can to come back happy and healthy. <laughs> so everything I talked about is a work in progress. 
all these tips, I wish I could say I was wonderful and doing it all perfectly all the time, but I'm still continuing to try to apply these principles and um, especially in my life as a med student, when I want to work in wilderness medicine, it's constantly a practice. So I want to just tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now. Uh, Jasmine mentioned briefly, I run a nonprofit called Say to Do. We work in Haiti in this really impoverished area called City Soleil. They didn't have any medical care, period. So what we do is we actually train Haitian healthcare workers because a lot of times after the earthquake in Haiti, there was all these expatriate medical volunteers who would fly in, treat patients for a week, and then fly back out. So the continuity of care wasn't there, the high level of care for patients wasn't there. And I looked around and I saw so many of my friends who I met who were Haitian out of work, and I thought, this is silly. So we set up a scholarship and training program for healthcare workers. So we now train a bunch of nurses. We have about four nurses on staff now who we've put through nursing school. We have another two in training this year. So the clinic is entirely Haitian-led, Haitian-run, and we treat about 90 to 120 patients a month. So if anyone wants to talk about that, happy. If anyone has any questions, happy to answer. Um, but thank you so much for listening.